My greetings, the ruthless MC Juan Zarate here. Today we will be going over the descriptions of motion. Now let's begin. Physicists describe the motion of a particle via two different ways, one with mathematical equations and the other with graphs. Either is appropriate for the study of kin kinematics. Each one simply provides a different benefit, as I would say. Mathematical equations provide the benefit of being more precise. They provide more precession than a set of graphical sketches. Graphs, on the other hand, are better in the case of which they provide much greater physical insights on the motion of a particle. Now that we understand that part, we can move on to the main question. The main question is how do we com obtain a complete description of the motion of a particle? Now this question may be answered this way. The complete description of the motion of a particle may be obtained if we know its mathematical dependence to its position x relative to a chosen origin of a frame of reference at all times t. That that part is going to guide us through this entire lecture. Now let's go over the forms of motion that we may encounter in the real world. The first one being no motion at all. This is actually the most encountered form of motion in the real world. I am going to have some video game footage of it in a second after I describe it. Here the function that describes a particle that is not moving at all is simply x of t is equal to j, j being the coordinate slash position that the particle attends for the entire time t at which, at which it is not moving. The graph looks like this. It's simply a line with a slope of zero. Again, this is encountered the most in the real world, such as we see this every day, such as buildings, your bed, your video game consoles, kidding, screw consoles, PC. Um, here, I have some Minecraft footage to show you all that, that uh, demonstrates no motion at all. I hope that was entertaining. Now let's move on. One quantity that is used to measure the motion of a particle is velocity. Velocity in the case of one dimensional motion is positive when the particle moves in the direction at which x increases. Velocity is negative when it moves in the opposite direction as one could have guessed. Another way to measure the motion of a particle is via a quantity called speed. Speed is by definition the scalar magnitude of a velocity vector which thus accounts for the fact that it is always positive. Now let's move on to this, this form of motion, simply motion at a constant velocity, or constant speed, another way to say it. Now the function that represents this form of motion is simply x of t is equal to a plus bt. This is the customary form of the equation of a line, of course known by 8th graders as y equals mx plus b. Alright, this is the graph that represents this form of motion. It is simply a straight line, um, a straight line with a slope. From calculus, we know that the slope of any line, the slope of any function, gives us its rate. In this case, the rate, b slash slope, is the velocity. And of course, by you can tell by the slope that it is constant, which thus accounts for the fact that the velocity is also constant, thus proving that this is the graph that represents the uh, constant represents motion at constant velocity. Now, I have a video sh of constant velocity to show you on. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, let's move on to the next form of motion. The next form of motion is accelerated motion. Acceleration is by definition the rate of change of velocity. Due to the fact that velocity is a vector, acceleration is also a vector. Thus meaning it is always, and I mean always, associated with a direction. Now, in this case of motion, speed is changing, and thus the slope must also change. Therefore, the graphs are curves rather than lines, as we have been dealing with up above. Alright, let's move on to two examples that I have. Here is a parabola, which can represent the motion of a, of a projectile. The function that represents this form of motion is x of t is equal to a plus bt plus ct squared. This is, again, the customary form for the equation of a parabola. This is the graph. As you can see, it is a curve. And do notice, as long as c is greater than zero, velocity is increasing. It may also be phrased with velocity is positive. In this case, you can see here that we are dealing with many rates, or as one may call it, derivatives. Um, due to the fact that 
derivative is defined as the instantaneous rate of change of a function. That thus means a derivative of any point defined by this equation is the instantaneous velocity at that point. This is the equation that represents that represents instantaneous velocity. That is the definition of instantaneous velocity, should I say. Now that we understand this part, let's move on to the next example that I have. Here I have, an, uh, here I have a particle oscillating from point A to point negative A. This can be, say, a pendulum or a mass on a spring, something you do tend to encounter in the real world. Here you can see it's a cosine function, as you could have guessed by the function. The function is x of t is equal to a times cosine of quantity omega times t. Omega is the angular velocity of whatever we're dealing with here. It could be a pendulum or a mass on a spring. Um, Alright, I have a video to show you all. I hope you all enjoy it. up one quick thing I want to tell you all we seldom ever encounter a particle or any other object moving at constant velocity in the real world why you may ask I don't know why I'll ask you how easy it is is it driving at 35 miles per hour for say an hour through the your street or anywhere else we always have to accelerate at some point either via changing direction or slowing down when you see the police or s speeding up when you see the police all right, another quick thing I want to tell you all is something that's very interesting. It's called Zeno's Paradox. This is a paradox that states, if motion exists, how can we cover an infinite number of distances in a finite amount of time? What this means is, I have an example. Say I were to travel from point A to point B, point A to point B. In order for me to have traveled this entire distance, I would have had to have traveled half of that distance from A to B. In order, in order for me to have traveled half of the distance between A to B, I would, have have, I would have had to have traveled half of that distance, and also half of that distance, half of that distance, along with half of that distance. As you can see, it goes on forever. What that means is we have to cover an infinite number of dist distances in a finite amount of time. That's impossible. We can't cover infinity in a finite amount of time. And that thus means motion does not exist. Motion is just a paradox. Now, of course, we all know that it's not true. It was just something that came up back in the day when the concept of infinity was not yet well understood by mathematicians. Mathematicians did not want to deal with infinity in any way possible and thus called motion an illusion. That is all. Uh, it's a very Zeno's paradox is very interesting, usually introduced in most AP calculus courses in high school. Usually, not always. I hope you all enjoyed my video. Farewell.